come up with some cash? Yeah, the operation's really going well. Uh, there's production's a lot better than we hoped. Um, we're going to have to pay a lot of tax, though. The local accountant says it's going to be 25 percent of the net. There's not much wiggle room. Our local partner told me about how we can ship the profits offshore to a trading company. They do it all the time. I'm here in Jensen Town. I'm about to talk to the attorney to set up a trading company here. Okay. How do we get cash back to the U.S.? Just loan it back. Then whoever buys us out in a few years can worry about it. We could better run that by our CPA. Maybe he can figure out how to get the deductions in the U.S. too. That sort of tax planning hasn't worked for 50 years. I'm Steve Fox. I've been advising clients on international tax matters for almost 40 years. The international portions of U.S. tax law and regulations are quite complex. They're designed to prevent the plan you just overheard. Tax in the United States does not follow financial statements. Income and expense are recognized and measured under tax rules, not accounting rules. One key item relates to dividends. The shareholder is not taxed on corporation income until the shareholder receives a distribution of that income called a dividend. In the U.S., Residents, citizens, and U.S. corporations are subject to income tax on their worldwide income. To help prevent double tax, they get a credit for foreign income taxes. But the credit is limited to that part of U.S. tax caused by foreign source income. Non-residents are only taxed on income from doing business in the U.S. and income of certain types from U.S. sources. Source of income is thus important for both residents and non-residents. The normal tax rules apply in the international area, with only a few exceptions. Some anti-deferral rules require U.S. shareholders of foreign corporations to recognize taxable income before they get dividends. The two key parts of these anti-deferral rules are subpart F and PFIC. Individuals, corporations, estates, and trusts are directly subject to income tax. Partnerships and other flow-through entities are not themselves subject to tax. Under the U.S. system, the partners are taxed on their share of partnership income. Beneficiaries of estates and trusts are also subject to tax on income distributed to them from the estate or trust. In most countries, an entity is classified as a corporation, partnership, or trust based on the legal formalities of how it was set up. The U.S., though, has rules under which a business entity, including an LLC, may elect whether it's treated as a corporation or a partnership. These are called the check-the-box rules. Yes, Mark? Professor, I thought an LLC was always a partnership. An LLC or any business entity gets to choose. The check-the-box rules don't allow U.S. corporations to choose and don't allow foreign corporations of a type that's publicly traded to choose. Those entities are always treated as corporations. Everybody else gets to make an election. Note that a U.S. corporation wholly owned by U.S. resident individuals may elect to be an S-corporation, which is treated much like a partnership. In the international context, this entity classification issue can be quite complex. We're going to talk about inbound, that is, tax on non-residents, and outbound, that is, tax on residents and U.S. corporations. As pointed out before, there's a big difference between how residents and citizens are taxed and how non-residents are taxed. 
We need to understand that difference as well as what resident means. U.S. citizens and residents, including U.S. corporations, are taxed on their worldwide income from all sources. This includes income from foreign operations, foreign accounts, foreign investments, foreign wages, everything. This has the potential to cause tax on the same income by a foreign country as well as the U.S. To mitigate this, a credit for foreign income taxes paid or accrued is allowed to citizens and residents. This credit is limited, though, as I'll discuss at length. By contrast, non-residents are taxed only on income from the U.S. There are two non-overlapping methods of tax. Wages and income earned in a U.S. business are taxed the same as if the foreigner were a resident. However, some deductions are not allowed. Then, dividends, interest, rents, royalties, annuities, and some other kinds of income are subject to a flat 30% tax rate with no deductions allowed. This 30% tax is withheld by the U.S. payor of the income and paid directly to the IRS. So who's treated as a resident? For corporations, it's really easy. A corporation is resident in the country in which it was incorporated or organized. When I talk about residents, I'm including U.S. corporations. For U.S. citizens, it's also really easy. They're taxed on their worldwide income regardless. For individuals who are not citizens, it's hairier. There are two tests, and meeting either one results in residence. Anyone holding a permanent resident permit, called a green card, is treated as a U.S. resident until they give up the green card. Anyone else must count their days in the U.S. each year. If they are in the U.S. 30 days or more, they are potentially resident under the 183 test. For this test, add up the number of current year days, one-third of first prior year days, and one-sixth of second prior year days. If this number exceeds 183, then they are resident. However, if they can show that they had a closer business and personal connection to another country, they may still be non-resident. Tax treaties often have a tiebreaker rule that can treat the individual as resident of one country or the other when the rules say that they're resident of both. Residence for flow-through entities, such as partnerships, is irrelevant. The partner's residence is what counts, since the partnership is not taxed.